All right, hello. My name is Ian Myers from Johns Hopkins University, and I'm here today to talk to you about ZeroCoin, which is a distributed uh, eCash system based on Bitcoin that we wrote a paper on, which got into the IEEE um, Symposium on Security and Privacy, which is actually like this Monday, which is why I'm actually in San Francisco. <clears throat> so, I guess what is eCash? eCash is, of course, short for electronic cash, which is itself a form of digital money. But what exactly is money? Well, money is a convenience. Excuse me. Right? We didn't want to, our ancestors didn't want to carry around all this stuff to trade with everybody, so instead they carried around some medium of exchange that everyone would take. Yeah, sorry. I'm a little flustered from, from trying to get here. Bear with me. Um, and so as a result, people tried to carry around smaller and smaller things because you really didn't want to carry everything with you. So people carried around like precious metals like gold or silver. And of course, that's still a little bit of a pain. Those things weigh a fair amount. So people started carrying around paper money, right, which is redeemable for gold or silver if you went to a bank or a government or whoever was running these schemes. But that's still a little inconvenient because you have to carry around all this money in your wallet. So how do you carry around the minimal thing? And one of the ways to do this is to digitize money. And there's sort of two ways to do this. You can try to make digital cash which is a digital analog of cash, and so it's, it's actually anonymous, and it's difficult to counterfeit. And this is, in fact, quite hard to do, because making digital goods that you can't copy is nigh unto impossible. If you think about how easy it is for a 14-year-old kid to pirate the latest Justin Bieber album, and you consider that a $20 bill is probably worth considerably more than Justin Bieber, you have some idea about the, of the scope of the problem. So in practice, people don't do that. Instead, they do digital cash. Which, uh, digital checks, excuse me, which we are all familiar with. This is how debit cards work. You go to the grocery store, you swipe your card, and the money gets taken from your account and put into the uh, grocery store's account. And this is quite convenient, but maybe for this convenience we paid a price. Maybe we paid too high a price. What, what did we lose here? And the answer is, in fact, that we lost privacy. Because in this system, the bank sees everything you do, right? They see who you do it with, when you do it, how much, and where, and they remember that forever. Banks are sort of like elephants. This doesn't go away. Almost as significantly, the merchants who you're dealing with now see what you do. They get to trace every single interaction you have with them, even if you don't see the same cashier or go to the same store. And this is sort of a problem, because if you think about it, people will go to fairly long lengths to avoid this kind of tracking online. They'll disable cookies, they'll use NoScript, some people even use Tor. And yet, we have this thing in, you know, real life that is tracking you about that well. Oh, sorry. And so the question then is, maybe we should have revisited this digital cash thing. And in fact, a bunch of academics did in the 80s and, and more recently. And the result basically is you can't make uncopyable digital goods, but you can make single-use ones. So the idea here is, is if you get a coin from the bank, that coin has a serial number on it. And you can make as many copies of, as you want, but it still has to have that serial number on it because that's what the bank signed. And then to spend that coin, you give it to the merchant and they check with the bank that that serial number is unspent. And so the second copy of it you made is useless, as is the thousandth, as, as is the millionth. You can only use it once. So this is how we get the uncopyable part effectively. But how do we get anonymity out of this, right? Serial numbers are traceable. And so that doesn't really get us anywhere, it seems. And so the breakthrough that was done originally in 1982 by someone named David Chom was to use what are known as blind signatures, which basically allowed the bank to, instead of signing a serial number on a coin, to sign a opaque envelope containing a serial number. And so the idea here is all the envelopes are the same, and so the bank will give you one of these with a serial number in it. Well, you'll give the bank one of them, it'll sign it, you'll get it back. And then to spend it, you will hand the envelope to the merchant, and the merchant will make sure the signature is valid and then open the envelope, take out the serial number, check that it's not double spent, and then record it on, on the list of spent ones. This gets you anonymity because the bank has no idea where the coin that you just spent come, came from because they've never seen the serial number. And so this is actually quite effective. This gets us privacy and this has been extended by a large amount of work. But of course, none of this stuff really took off. How many of you have, here have heard of DigiCash? How many of you ever used it? Oh, that's way more people than I expected. But the point is, nonetheless, that it didn't really see any widespread adoption. And the reason 
we'll see in a second. If you consider what you actually want from a digital currency system, you want it to be secure. This is the sin quo non, so, so to speak. If your system can have money counterfeited or stolen, it is, of course, a punchline. It's not a currency system. As we just saw, you would really like it to be private. But the more important feature, I think, in terms of getting these things adopted is that you'd like it to be decentralized, right? Because if you have to convince people that to use their system, they either have to trust some bank, who, by the way, you also have to convince to use your currency, and that's really hard, or that they have to trust some company that you started to do this, i.e. Digicash, you're probably not going to succeed. But if you have a distributed system, you can just sort of set it up, build it, and they will come. And in fact, this is you know, what happened with Bitcoin. I'm going to assume, unlike the talk I'm giving on Monday or Tuesday, that you guys are all familiar with Bitcoin and I don't need to really go into the background. Uh, I certainly hope so. But I would just point out that Bitcoin has a transaction log called the blockchain, which has everyone's transactions in it, and these are uh, public. Um, this is actually a useful feature for what we build on top of it, but it's also the motivating case for it. Because if we look at how Bitcoin adds up, stacks up as a currency, ideally, it is clearly decentralized. It is pretty clearly secure. But is it private? That's sort of an open question, right? So let me stop for a second and give you a little digression, right? When people say privacy in terms of Bitcoin, they usually talk about anonymity. A lot of press things I've read say Bitcoin is anonymous. And so anonymity as a technical mean thing means if you think about like knowing someone's name, if I'm trying to guess your name and we say it's anonymous, then you could have any name of all the six billion some odd people on the planet. I know nothing about you. On the other hand, if we know that you might have one of a possible smaller subset of names, if you can go to like the grocery store and pretend to be John one day and go to somewhere else and pretend, pretend to be Jack another day, then we say that you don't have anonymity, you have pseudonymity because you're known to people as a different set of finite pseudonyms. And the problem with pseudonymity is that it's actually somewhat easy to link pseudonyms together. Maybe the two different uh, stores you were going to noticed that you drove home to the same house, and now they know that they probably belong to the same person. Maybe somehow you just found out that Samuel Clemens and Mark Twain are the same person. Right? And so this is the problem that Bitcoin has, because Bitcoin's transaction store is public. But of course, it's not, it doesn't have your name associated with it. It has public keys that you have, and you can have as many of them as you want. But linking those public keys together turns out to not be that hard, and there's a lot of sort of techniques you can leverage from, from computer science, right? I'm actually a, a PhD student uh, and work in academia normally. There are a lot of techniques you can, can leverage from there to actually end up with uh, identifying information about people. And so it's an interesting question, right? Are these techniques that people have done in data mining and graph theory applicable to Bitcoin? And the answer is yes. And in fact, the preliminary results people have looked at are not really that good. And I must emphasize that these are preliminary results. The people who mainly looked at this were cryptographers. This sort of got on everyone's academic radar about a year, a year and a half ago. And cryptographers are very good at doing cryptography and security, but they're not domain experts in data mining. And so the results they got are not going to be as good as the results of the people who do this uh, as their main thing. And so when those people start looking at this, these results are going to get even better from the academic point of view, or worse if you actually care about privacy. Right. Most significantly, all of these, uh, these papers, to the best of my knowledge, are passive. People are just downloading the blockchain and looking at it. They are not trying to insert things into the blockchain that they might use to tag people. And that is, of course, a more powerful class of things that you can investigate. And so the reality of the matter is that we have to sort of assume, based on this kind of stuff, that Bitcoin, in terms of as is, is not really private. In fact, it's, it's definitely worse than cash, because cash was anonymous. I contend it's actually worse than the bank, because at least in the case of the bank, it was the bank and whoever they told that knew your stuff. Your neighbors didn't, your family didn't, your co-workers didn't. Unless, of course, you worked at a bank and they had bad security stuff, but that's a side question. So in fact, with Bitcoin, it's worse than this. All your information is known to everybody, except, of course, the bank, because we managed to get rid of that, thankfully. So I know what you're thinking, right? This is, this is nice, but what I just outlined requires a fair amount of effort to get this data, right? You might have to run some stuff on a large cluster of computers. And the first point is, we don't know that yet, right? These are preliminary results, and the results will only get better, um, assuming Bitcoin stays statically where it is. But the second point is, that's not really a barrier to entry right now. 
right? Companies are willing to do a large amount of data mining to identify information about you anyway, right? This is, I'll give you a story from the New York Times from a while ago. Target does uh, data mining on their customers to give them targeted coupons that they mail to them. And apparently they have a fairly good set of algorithms that will determine when someone was pregnant. Allegedly, they claimed that they could actually figure this out before the person themselves knew. So that should be really creepy to you and kind of Orwellian. Thankfully, I'm not sure they could actually do that. This is a throwaway quote. You might be skeptical. But what you shouldn't be skeptical of is the fact that they can certainly identify this kind of information once you know you're pregnant. And so Target does this on a regular basis. And they, in fact, did this with one of their customers. And they sent out the information to the, the coupons to the person at the house. Unfortunately for this person, but fortunately for us, because it gives us a nice parable about privacy in the digital age, the person in question was a 16-year-old girl who was living at home with her parents, who did not, until that moment, know that she was pregnant. And so you might want to like, think that people won't do large amounts of data intensive analysis to figure out things about you, but in fact they will, right? There's a monetary incentive to do this. Another one, which as far as I know is sort of a, a blue skies kind of thing that no one does right now, at least I hope not, is credit card companies, right? Need to have a good amount of information about your spending habits to determine how much money they're gonna to lend to you. And this is of course, there's big money involved in this. And if they had access to all of your financial history, every single transaction you've made, right? Not just the ones you've made with them, not just whether you've paid your bills on time, but who you bought, what you bought, who you bought it with, when, where, how, what, and how much money you were getting paid like on a regular basis and you know, whether you were living hand to mouth or not. That would be pretty valuable and they'll probably would be willing to invest a fair amount of effort in figuring that kind of information out. And you could see this also apply to like insurance or maybe even people doing employment. But so there is actually a motivation to extract this information, even if it's non-trivially computationally complex. And so this should worry you. So how do we fix this? Well, the first sort of principled solution is to try to build the academic eCash stuff I outlined earlier on top of Bitcoin. As I understand it, people actually tried this, right? They tried to have a central bank that took Bitcoins that issued you eCash tokens that you could then redeem and get back Bitcoins. The problem, of course, with this is that it requires some central bank or quorum of like five or 10 or 20 people to run it. And of course, no one's really gonna trust them, right? They could just go out of business or they could print way more money than they said, devalue the currency and make money out of it. So as far as I understand, this idea was more or less stillborn from when someone came up with it. Um, it's definitely not ideal. The second one is Bitcoin laundries. And this is sort of the more uh, pragmatic solution that's in existence today. The idea here is that you take your Bitcoins and you get together with a bunch of other people and you hand those to someone and they launder them together, uh, exchange them around, and then you get them back, but not your coins, just a comparable amount. So the problem with this is that, of course, it's not decentralized. You have to find someone to, doing, to do the mix, right? And you have to trust them not to just take your money, at least under naive constructions. The second problem is, is that it's not really private, right? Because you have to trust that at least one of the mixes you use doesn't log how it mixed the stuff. Because if they know who got what and they keep a record of it, then you can figure, then there's no anonymity involved if they publish that record. The second problem, which is sort of more fundamental, is that mixes suffer from limited throughput because you have to get a bunch of people together to engage in this protocol. And so you're not gonna get full anonymity, remember, right? You're not gonna get to be the anonymous out of the entire population of Earth or the entire population of Bitcoin users. You're gonna get your coins mixed with however many people you came up with who wanted to do this that day or that hour. And that's a smaller number. And so just that's not as good as we could do, right? And academics kind of wanna figure out what's the best theoretically possible solution, even if it's not completely practical, and then work to making it practical, not to start with the practical solution. So this is where zero coin comes in. Zero coin is a distributed approach to building electronic e-cash on top of uh, Bitcoin, right? It extends Bitcoin by adding an anonymous currency on top of it, which is called zero coin, somewhat uncreatively, right? Um, and zero coins are exchangeable for Bitcoins, just as the US dollar was, used to be backed by gold and you could exchange a dollar bill for uh, $1 worth of gold, you can exchange whatever the denomination of zero coins is for the equivalent value of Bitcoins. And that's sort of the entire way we get value from this. We don't have to invent our own currency and convince people to use it. <clears throat> so before I get into the details of how this works, I would say that there have been a couple of interesting sort of things I've seen people talking about this. The first one is some people got some idea that there was a backdoor in this from, uh, well, uh, 
perfectly fine and innocent paragraph in the paper and then a somewhat unfortunately worded answer to a reporter's question who was, I think, kind of digging for, for exactly that answer. There is no back door in this. In fact, you really can't put one in it in the sense of having something covert because it's going to be an open source thing. There's a paper which has the protocol in it and an actual like verifiable mathematical proof that this thing is secure. And so if you stuck this in the open source code, you'd notice that it deviated from the protocol and you'd you know, go, why is this? And when there was no good answer, you'd know that it was a backdoor in it. Right? So th th there's no backdoor. We had no intention of ever putting one in there. The argument was that, and what the paper was trying to say was, even if you're one of those people who has the, if you have nothing to hide, you, you, should, you don't need privacy people, that argument doesn't work in this case, right? Because maybe you have nothing to hide from the government, but you certainly have things to hide from your neighbors and your family and like people doing targeted advertising. And even if you think the government should have access to all this stuff, it needs to be an honest, anonymous to everyone else. And so you need to figure out how to solve this problem anyway. And so that's, that's sort of the fundamental thing. The second point is that people have been complaining that, that paradoxically, that maybe you don't want anonymity in Bitcoin perfectly because it will cause the government to uh, close you down. I don't really know how to balance these two things. I, I think that, you know, there's different people saying it, but it, it's kind of funny. And the observation there is, of course, well, you know, government could ban it. They could force you to, to like overtly report what you're doing to them. I don't think that would work. I don't think people would adopt it. I'm personally never going to do anything that allows you to do that. Um, and then second, there are techniques that actually could solve, like prevent money laundering without revealing your privacy. Because if you do things that are sort of patterns, that look like they're money laundering, you can make the cryptography actually fail in a subtle way and it will actually identify some, some, something to everyone. But if you're a legitimate user and you don't do things like this, like transfer millions of dollars between people, you're fine. And this is not in zero coin today and it, it may or never make it into it, but it's an option. And if people really think the government's going to come give you that kind of a problem and it's necessary for this to survive, you could add it. I doubt in practice that anyone would because people want you know, freedom to do what they want and that's you know, perfectly fine. So what is zero coin? Uh, this is going to be a high level talk. I don't want to get into the bog down of the cryptographic details because I don't really have time. Um, but as I said, zero coin is economically a promissory note redeemable for Bitcoin. Cryptographically, it's another opaque envelope containing a serial number, right? The same double spending techniques apply, right? You get the envelope, you can only use it once because you have to open it and reveal the serial number. You can make as many copies as you want, but that serial number is still the same and it's still one time use. So, Right, you stuff a serial number in there. So how does this actually work, right? Well, we can't use uh, cryptographic techniques, uh, sorry, we can't use blind signatures to do this because we have no central bank, right? There's no one who can hold a signing key, right? We want to be in a decentralized system. So instead, we make another, our contribution was basically figuring out another way to make an opaque envelope and make it actually work. Um, and so we use what's, what are known as cryptographic commitments, the details of which are irrelevant here. Um, anyone can make one of these commitments with the public parameters. And so you might think that there's no value in the system. Uh, but in fact, what you do is you create this envelope and then to give it value, you have to insert a zero coin mint transaction onto the blockchain, which takes as an input one, uh, one or two or 20, whatever the denomination is, bitcoins, and contains in that transaction your uh, opaque envelope with a serial number in it. And so when you spin this, the person you spend it with, or if you spend it with yourself to use it as a mix, you get back a Bitcoin. So what happens to these Bitcoins? Where do they come from? Where do they go? These spent Bitcoins that you put in the zero coin mint transaction don't go anywhere. They get escrowed on the blockchain, so to speak. And so to spend a zero coin, you reveal the serial number in that envelope, and you prove in zero knowledge uh, that it's from some zero coin in the blockchain without revealing what zero coin that is. And this is how you get your anonymity because it's back to the opaque envelope thing. The, everyone who looks at it has no idea where this zero coin came from. They don't know if it was the first one that was put on the blockchain or the nth or the fifth or the 20th or whatever. They just know it's valid. It's one of them. It's not counterfeit. Um, of course, when you spend it, the serial number is marked as spent on the blockchain um, and the recipient gets back a random uh, Bitcoin from the escrow pool. So the idea here is if you can see that diagram, uh, Bitcoin goes into a zero coin, that's the white non-heavy set coins, and then there's a link between the two of them, that's that dotted line, but that link is not known to anybody but you, because the zero knowledge proof takes care of that. So briefly, what are zero knowledge proofs? Well, zero knowledge proofs are due to Goldwasser and Macaulay in the 80s and expanded by a bunch of people, 
And this was actually Turing Award winning work. It got the people who did it the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in computer science. Um, because you can't unfortunately get, much to my chagrin, an actual Nobel Prize in computer science. It's kind of a, you know, a problem. Uh, but they allow you to prove knowledge of some value satisfying a statement. Like, e.g., I know the square root of some, of some number, or I know the factorization of uh, some number, like maybe an RSA uh, key, without revealing that value. So they're called zero knowledge because the only thing the person learns is that you know this thing. They don't know what you act, what it is. And so this is how we prove that we have a zero coin from the blockchain without revealing what it is. Because of course, if we pointed to this is the serial number of that zero coin, it would be completely linkable. But with this zero knowledge proof, with this layer of indirection, you learn nothing other than the serial number, which of course, because the envelope's opaque, no one has ever seen. So, this works reasonably well for a prototype system. It takes about a second to make one of these coins. It takes about half a second to create the proof when you spend it, and another half a second to verify it. This is from a prototype implementation we have that was a modified version of the Bitcoin D client, which we should be releasing sometime in June. And the problem, of course, with these things, though, is that the proofs are a little large. They're about 40 kilobytes right now. And we have some ways to fix that, uh, which I will get to in a second. So, what needs to be done? Well, first of all, we need to get this to scale to larger networks. The proofs are constant size of the number of coins on the blockchain, and so that's already a very useful thing. But as the Bitcoin network gets larger, as you get more peers in it, there is this problem, and Bitcoin sort of has this already, um, that when you're forwarding transactions, currently Bitcoin checks them on forward, not just when you're going about to make a block. And so that adds a propagating delay from node to node to node, and people want to actually reduce the time that, that takes by getting faster ECDSA algorithms and such. I believe this work is, is mainly really forward-looking and isn't currently a problem. It is a problem with zero coin. Zero coin, of course, because the, because the proofs take so much longer to verify actually exacerbates this problem to the point where it would be a, an issue now. Luckily speaking, the only reason Bitcoin does this, to the best of my knowledge, is to prevent people from flooding the network with bogus transactions. It's a, it's a health of the network thing. And there are other ways to prevent that. There's other techniques from distributed systems and the academic literature, and there are actually techniques that are used in practice in some, in some systems, I believe. I'm not actually an expert on distributed systems. That give you this without having to check every transaction. You might check probabilistically. You might assign reputation to peers in the network. There are a bunch of various ways to do it. The second thing we need to do is we need to reduce the proof sizes. 40 kilobytes is feasible, but it's a little unfortunate. And there are cryptographic constructions we have that will get you smaller proofs, but they're on, on less standard assumptions. Uh, and so that might be okay because assumptions only affect anonymity. The system is still secure under like the fact that RSA is secure, but it might be a little easier to de-anonymize you than with these constructions, but that probably is a worthwhile price to pay to have the system be more efficient. Final thing to do is to make the coins divisible. In fact, we have a construction to do this that is efficient. And by efficient, I mean like the proofs are one to two kilobytes so that you can have divisible coins that are of not of fixed denomination. So this is actually a really useful thing because now we hide how much money you're spending with everybody else. The merchant still knows, right? Because they need to know you gave them the correct amount of money. But no one else can, has to see that necessarily until the merchant like redeems it. Um, and the ways to make that indirect. Um, the last thing, and this is a non-technical problem, but actually wasn't obvious to me until I talked to people who were not academics, uh, is that we have to explain how this works, right? Bitcoin doesn't have that much uh, crypto in it. It's not that bad. But this does. Zero-knowledge proofs are actually quite complex. And in fact, usually speaking, uh, explaining zero-knowledge proofs to people is an exercise in demonstrating their existence. Because by the end of the talk, you will have convinced people that you know what a zero-knowledge proof is and they will have no idea whatsoever. <laughs> and this is a problem. Right? I didn't even attempt to do this here. Uh, and that's something that's gotta, gotta be worked on. There's apparently a book explaining zero knowledge uh, proofs to your children, which I think is not very good. There's a subsequent one that uses where is Waldo? So you can prove in zero knowledge that you know where Waldo is on a, on a picture without actually telling someone. It's actually pretty simple. You ch uh, punch a hole on a really large sheet of paper and you just, you know, position it over the thing so you can't tell where, you know, it is, but you see water through the hole. Um, so why am I here? Well, other than the fact that it was convenient because I already was in town, I'm kind of trying to figure out where this goes from here, right? We just wrote a paper and a prototype software implementation, and we'd like to see it used and we'd like to do work on it, but I need 
feedback, right? I live in not quite an ivory tower. The roof leaks, it's not that tall, but it's close enough. Um, so how does this get, okay, how does this get adopted? Um, as part of Bitcoin? Okay, that's like the ideal and not that likely. As part of some alternative currency? Maybe, I don't know. Has it become its own alternative currency that actually has like the claim to fame is it's really anonymous? I, I don't know, I'd, I'd like to know. Um, the other question is if we go with the current construction, where do the proofs go? There are 40 kilobytes, you can't fit those in the blockchain, so currently we fit the hash of them in the blockchain and you had to retrieve them. Right, that's fine, you can retrieve them for a DHT or somewhere, but they could of course go away eventually. It's not clear to me that that matters, right? Because after 30 or 40 uh, confirmations, what do you care, right? I know people want to go back and validate the whole history of a, of a, of a Bitcoin, but it's not clear that that's analogous for a zero coin because they're anonymous. So the degree to which you backtrack and what you get from that information is not really that satisfying. And so the last thing, of course, is how do we explain this to people? And so I don't know if I have time for questions. I will certainly be around after this for uh, as long as people want to talk. Um, and that's that. Thank you. That's, that's a perfectly reasonable point, and we didn't, like, yeah, that, if that ever yeah. happened, it's a very long way down. Yeah, it, it, you know, ultimately, it's just so many people are so excited, but let's yeah. just make it clear, but yeah. thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll amend that to yeah. the talk when I give it later. Um, thanks for the exciting talk. Um, what do you expect the demand for zero coin or laundering in general to be both in, in the short and long term? I'm not entirely clear on that. First of all, it depends on where Bitcoin gets used. Uh, if it gets used in sort of real world transactions, I'd say that the, the ability to de-anonymize people goes up because there's a lot more information. But conversely, my, my intuition is not is that people would be using it in real world transactions on a daily basis if it's like more common care about privacy probably, but they don't think about it and they're not really aware of the issues. So it's sort of a balancing act there. Um, I guess that was long term. In the short term, it seems from people's interest in the thing that there was a degree of excitement to it. Whether this was just people going, oh, this looks cool, people really wanted to use it, I have no way to know because it's not around yet for people to try. Whoever gets the microphone next. Go ahead. Thanks. A couple of questions. Um, so one of the things that you seem to describe is a distributed escrow, mm -hmm. um, which is complicated in and of itself. So I'm wondering how you manage to make sure that only the person who's supposed to be pulling the coin is pulling the coin from the escrow. Ah. So then, we had to modify uh, the Bitcoin scripting language. We added an instruction. And so what it is is you construct a mint transaction which takes as an input a Bitcoin and the requirement for paying that instead of getting a signature right, is that you actually provide the zero knowledge proof that validates with respect to the list of coins that is in the network. Great, and the second question is, assuming you're using fractional coins um, or very specific denominations, so I want, you know, I have a very specific denomination that I want to pull out, um, how is that not going to be easily traceable if a lot of other people aren't using exactly the same denomination? That would be trivially traceable, and so if you use the construction in the paper, you would have to, in fact, uh, be use like large fixed denominations. In fact, we were thinking there would originally just be one, um, sort of like Highlander, right? Um, but with the stuff we figured out later, which I stress is quite efficient for divisibility, the proofs for spinning are still as, uh, as uh, complex, you don't care because ne that's never public except to the merchant. And so he just knows that you spin him, give him $3.55, and he learns that no matter what, but no one else sees the transaction values. And so that's actually hidden with the advances on it. So that sort of solves that problem, thankfully. So we're unfortunately out of time. Why don't we give our speaker a hand and we'll get ready for the next. <laughs>